He slept with Hagar, verse 5. Then Sarai said to Abram, You are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. Hmm. It was the woman you placed in the garden. It was the serpent. It was that six foot tall gentleman who walked into my ethics class. That, like, right? Like, it's always somebody else. God, is, God has promised to Abram and Sarai that he is going to provide a descendant. This promise has been established. But once we start to move the chess pieces and it doesn't go how we anticipated it going, because it never does. Hmm? My plans versus God's plan, those never, ever work out. But when they go wrong and we are surprised, immediately we turn to Abram, we turn to God, we turn to the person who we feel is at fault, and we seldom take responsibility. And this is a difficult reality. When we take the situation that we had handed over to God, when a God who is faithful to provide for us has promised us a thing and we try to move it along, it never turns out as well as we had just let, it, let him handle it. Amen? If we trust the thing to God and we are faithful to let him do the thing, it will always turn out better. And here the collateral, it's not just Abram. It's not just Sarai, it's also Hagar. And eventually, the collateral is also a boy who didn't ask for any of this, but gets put in the middle. Moving forward, verse five again. Then Sarai said to Abram, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my servant in your arms and now she knows she's pregnant. She despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Ooh, sometimes we're audaciously presumptuous. God is definitely going to be on my side in this situation. He is definitely on my side. And, and here we have like complex humanity, right? We're not seeing here how people should act. We are seeing here how people do act. Do you see the difference there? The only person doing exactly as they should is sovereign God over all. The people doing as they will, that is humanity. So Abraham says, do with her whatever you think is best. Then Sarai mistreated Hagar. Do you see the tension there? What does Abraham say to, her, to his wife? Do with her as you seem best. And what seemed best to Sarai? To mistreat her maidservant. It's a little bit too close to home. When we feel that injustice has been done, when we feel like our rights have been stepped on, when we feel that things are not as they should be, it is seldom love that comes out of us. Sometimes it is this kind of behavior, unless we invite God to do the thing for us. Hagar, so Sarai mistreats Hagar, so she fled from her. This is the only choice that she can make. And what is Hagar running to? What does she have? She's got nothing. She's pregnant and she has nothing. But the situation is so terrible that she would rather run away with nothing to her name than continue to experience the treatment that she has here. But because there has been a promise also over Hagar now, the story continues this way. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was a spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? Sometimes we find ourselves seated near a spring, not at the spring. Sometimes we find ourselves at the end of our resources, at the end of what we're able to do, and hopefully you know that there will be a God who encounters you there that asks you, sister, where are you coming from? Where are you going? Know that God will meet us in our dejection, in our suffering, in our sorrow, and ask us, Masiel, where are you coming from? My love, where are you going? And so she answers, I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> my, 
My friends, that is a powerful word, is it not? Go back to the situation that you found insufferable. Go back to the situation that you would rather be destitute than experience again. Go back to that mistress and submit. Whew, my Lord, my Lord. And this is how we know that Hagar is a deep and complex person. Because what does she do? The angel added, I will so increase your descendants that they will be too numerous to count. Pause. Before Hagar moves, what promise? Let me read it again. Let me read again. Verse 10. I will so increase your descendants that they will be too numerous to count. Who just got that blessing? Abram. Abram just got... Friends, this is delicious here. Abram, the chosen one who is going to be the father of nations, is given this almost identical blessing. And Hagar, this destitute slave with nothing, God also promises her the same thing. So when we feel like we've got nothing, when we feel like our hands are empty, know that there is a promise for you as well. It may not look like how you thought it would look like. It may surprise you, but he will not leave you destitute near the well. Verse 11, the angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now with child and you will have a son and you shall name him Ishmael for the Lord has heard your misery. The Lord has heard your misery. He said it to Hagar and he says it to you today. The Lord has heard your misery. Whatever it is, whatever weight, whatever pain, Whatever situation has brought you at this crossroads, if you're asking yourself, where am I coming from? Where am I going? Know this, that the Lord has heard your misery. He goes on to describe him, verse 13. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. as you are. You all look terrific on this Sabbath morning, but he sees you when you don't look this terrific. He sees you when you don't sound so terrific or you haven't said a really terrific thing or thought a really terrific thing. He sees you as you are and loves you still. And may Maybe this is the hundredth time you've heard it, but understand that he sees you exactly as you are and loves you still. You are the God who sees me, for she said, I have now seen the one that sees me. As divinity interacts with humanity, it does the audacious thing of seeing us exactly as we are, for who we really are, like terrible, broken, all of those things, and still chooses to reveal itself to us. God still says, I want you to see me. I want to interact with you. I want you to know that I see you and that I hear you, and when you cry, I will come and I will answer. And if I did it for this destitute maidservant in a difficult situation, know certainly that today, November 30th, 2024, God is still faithful to hear you and see you and come to you. He is still alive and well, and he is still interacting with humanity. Ah, but the Bible is delicious. And sometimes he tells the story again. So now turn with me to Luke chapter seven. Luke chapter seven. So we have encountered Hagar, who has seen the one who sees her, given the invitation that he hears her. And if you take time this afternoon, we don't have time this morning, read Genesis 21. The story continues. She is again left with nothing and God responds to her once again. If you have time this afternoon, take a look at Genesis 21. Luke chapter seven will be starting at verse 11. It is hard though sometimes when we think about a God who is, you know, like away and invisible or, or back in Genesis. I, sometimes I need, I need a, a clearer picture, right? I need, I need God to just be a little bit more, I don't know, human. 
And it's, it's wild that we have God made flesh here in this word. We have Jesus walking around amidst broken humanity, and we see him encountering grief once again. Starting at verse 7, pardon me, chapter 7 of the book of Luke, I'll be reading from verse 11. Verse 11. 